is you may be even going through some things right now that are really difficult. But God could be using those things so that one day he can send you to help someone. All right, uh, so we are beginning a new series called The Gifts of Jesus. And uh, this is not to be confused with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And yet there are many categories of gifts, and there are many that take these five and join them with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to say, most of you know this, but we believe fully in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, and the work of the Holy Spirit. So this is not to minimize the gifts of the Spirit at all. But these five are gifts of Jesus. And many, many people don't know that Jesus himself gave these gifts, and it actually follows up on Pastor Josh's series, to humanity, is the the Greek word here, to humanity or to mankind. Jesus himself gave these gifts, and they're in Ephesians 4. So we're going to go through them, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But what we're going to talk about is how does an apostle help me? How does a prophet help me? How does an evangelist help me? In other words, how, why did Jesus give you these gifts? And I, I, this series, let me give you the story of how this series came about, the burden for it. Um, we have some friends uh, that we went to high school with that we've reconnected with, and we just have a blast with them. And we get together normally every Memorial Day weekend and talk during the year when we can and one of them, this is a, he's a great, great, great guy. Uh, he sent an email to five friends and very, very honest and with a good spirit, very good spirit, and just said, um, why do I need a pastor? And he said, I've been trying to read the Bible, study the Bible on my own, and he's been a believer for years, but he was just admitting that, hey, I, I don't know everything. And, um, I see uh, deacons in the Bible, I see elders, I even see overseers, but why do I need a pastor? I, I, I grow, I read the Word, I study, I pray, uh, I have friends that speak into my life, my wife speaks into my life. I'm just wondering, scripturally, why do I need a pastor? And so I called him and said, hey, I want to answer your question, but I want to use some humor. I want to joke with you a little bit, if that's okay. And he said, absolutely, go for it, you know. So I said, well, you're asking the wrong person this question. Uh, You should be asking Jesus because Jesus is the one who gave the gift of a pastor. So you ought to ask Jesus, why did you give me this gift? And the other thing is, you might want to tell him, I said, can I joke a little further with you? He said, yes. I said, you might want to tell him that you want to return one of his gifts. <laughs> that after your study of the Bible, this one doesn't apply. And he didn't, you know, I'm just joking with the guy, you know, because I know him so well. I've known him since high school. He just, Jesus just missed it on this gift, you know. So and obviously I was joking. And then I explained to him that Ephesians 4 actually tells us why he gave us these gifts. And so that's what we're going to look at during this series. Let me just show you Ephesians 4 verse 8. It says, therefore he says, when he ascended, and this he is capitalized referring to Jesus. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He's the subject. He ascended He led captivity captive, referring to the Old Testament saints, and he gave gifts to men. So these are the gifts of Jesus. These are the only five gifts we're told he gave to men. And this word for men here is humanity. And then look at verse 11. And he himself gave. He himself gave. Jesus himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And then verse 12 tells us why. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So the reason he gave us these gifts 
are for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, I'm one of these gifts. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I just want you to know I am a gift from Jesus to you. <laughs> and, and you can't return me. Okay? Now, uh, but here's the thing. As a saint, as a believer in Christ, I do the work of the ministry. But as a pastor, I equip you to do the work of the ministry. In other words, when you say, I have a friend who's going through some marriage problems, pastor, will you talk to him? Well, yes, I do have some experience in that area. There are a lot of people who have more experience and are much better at marriage counseling than I am. But that's something you can do. You can be equipped to help people in their, in their marriage. And sometimes they do need professional help. Uh, you can, pastor, I have a friend who, who needs to accept Christ. Will you lead him to Christ? What I'd rather do is equip you to lead people to Christ. You see what I'm saying? So as a saint, I can lead people to Christ. But as a pastor, I equip you to lead people to Christ. Are, are y'all following me? So that's, that's what we do. So, um, I, so I asked my friend, I said, Okay, let me give you an example. So this is what pastors will do. They equip, this is what all five of them do. They equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So I said to him, um, do you listen to my messages? Have you ever listened to any of my messages? He said, we listen nearly every week on television. I said, okay, have any of my messages helped you? And he said, they've all helped me tremendously. I said, that's because I'm an equipper. That's because I'm gifted by God, and of course, all of us have gifts, all of us have gifts, but we have to develop a skill even in those gifts. I've developed, I've, I'm gifted by God, called by God, and I've developed my skill to equip you. So that's why, let me just, there's one reason why you need a pastor, because pastors equip people from the work of the ministry. And I said, now, you might be asking this question, you might not. But some people would ask this question, why do I need a pastor? Because there are some bad pastors. And there are some abusive pastors. Um, there are some pastors who want to be, who want to lord over you. Jesus even said, uh, we're not like that. We don't lord it over people. Uh, I came to serve, not to be served, and you need to do the same thing. The greatest is the servant. So he was saying servant leadership. Now listen to me. We need servant leaders, but let me say another way. We need leaders, but we don't need lords because we already have a lord. So you don't need a lord. You don't need me to be your lord, but you do need me to be your leader. And that doesn't mean that I, I, I'm not your lord. I don't boss you around. I don't tell you what you do. But I do lead you to learn how to hear the Holy Spirit and make godly decisions on your own. Are you following me? With godly counsel. That's what pastors do. So let's talk about how apostles help us because we'll get to pastors in the fourth week. Let's talk about apostles. And so the title of the message today, Apostles. Okay? So we're going to talk about apostles. First of all, you need to know there are more than 12. That's a common misunderstanding in the church, the 12 apostles. Um, uh, let me just sh kind of blow it away early because some will say, well, the apostles were sent by Jesus. The only problem with that is that one of them betrayed him. So now there are only 11. And they say, well, Paul took his place because he was sent by Jesus. And we're going to talk about Paul. Paul was an apostle. But let me just show you where the apostles First came from, all right? In Luke 9, verse 1, then he called. I just want you to notice the word called because we're going to talk about call, the difference between being called and being sent here in a moment. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, this word sent is the verb for apostle. It's um, apostello. The, the noun is apostos, apostolos, apostolos, 
which is an apostle, a person. But the verb, and the verb means send. So he uh, sent them, and again, this is the verb for the noun apostle, okay? Everyone got that? So he sends them. And then in verse 10, it says, and the apostles, let me say another one, another way, the sent ones. Uh, I, I just need to stop for a minute. So apostle means, this is what it means in the Greek, a person sent with the message. That's what it means. A person sent with a message. And it comes from a verb, which means to send, all right? So, and the apostles, verse 10, the sent ones, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Okay, so there are 12 of them, right? All right. The only problem is then Luke 10. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. And apostello them, sent them, same word. Two by two, before his face in every city and place where he went. Okay, so there weren't just 12. The very next chapter, he appoints 70 other sent ones and sends them, apostles. Here's my question. Are you a sent one? (laughs) Are there some people that God would like to send you to minister to? So that's why we want to talk about apostles because they, they send us. I took some business leaders to Israel a few years ago and I told them, you guys are apostles in the business world. In other words, God has sent you to the business world. Now, you're not apostles in that you don't equip others to be sent. That's, that's what God's called me to do. But you are sent ones. Every one of you are sent. You might be sent to educators because that might be your field. You might be sent to medical workers. You might be sent to construction workers. You might be sent to engineers. I don't know where you're sent. You might be sent, you are sent, I can tell you this, to your neighborhood. It's a, an apostle is a person sent by Jesus with a message. And if you don't think you've been sent by Jesus, just uh, read the Great Commission. He's sending us all. But apostles help us to be sent. Now, is there a process between being called and being sent? I, um, uh, I have a lot of people that don't understand that, that there's a process there was even a process with God's own son, Jesus. And Josh direct hit it in the first message, the humanity of Jesus. He was a carpenter until he was 30. Is it possible he made crutches when he was a carpenter for people he could have killed, uh, healed? Is it possible he was a, uh, I was thinking about people who had died on the next one. Is it possible he made caskets? for people he could have healed. See, for 30 years, he didn't do a miracle. What was God doing? The Bible says he was learning obedience during that time as a human. Obviously, he was fully divine and fully human, as Josh pointed out, but he was learning things. So there was a process even for for Jesus. So there's a process between the call and the sin. And and so many people will say to me, Pastor Robert, you just don't understand. I have a call on my life. What I want to say is, you don't understand, everybody has a call on their lives. It, it, it doesn't matter to me, to me what your call is. I'd like to know, have you been sent? Have you gone through the process to have the authority to function in your call? Because the, the process develops you to, to fulfill the responsibility of the call and the process, the, 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 the call is the, the what and the where, uh, and the to whom, but the, the sin is the authority and the anointing to minister in that area. And God develops a process in your life. So I'll give you a couple examples. Abraham was called 
at 75 to be the father of many nations, but he wasn't sent until he was 100. Isaac wasn't born until he was 100. By the way, the temptation between the call and the sin is to produce the call in the flesh. Now, that was better than you thought. (laughs) You don't have to applaud. That's just better than you thought. God called him to be a father when he was 75. He wasn't sent till he was 100, but when he was 86, he and Sarah figure out how to produce the call in the flesh. Moses was called to be a deliverer to Israel at birth, actually. But he wasn't sent until he was 80 years old. And at 40, he decided to produce the call in the flesh. And matter of fact, he was so arrogant, he decided that he could deliver Israel one Egyptian at a time. And then God says, you're not ready. So he sends him to a desert to, to herd sheep for 40 years. And then when God shows up and says to him, now you go deliver Israel from Egypt. Remember what Moses said? Uh, I, I can't talk. Well, you wouldn't be able to talk either if you've been talking to sheep for 40 years. And here's what God said when Moses said, uh, I, I can't do this. God said, now you're ready. Because at 40, you thought you could do it on your own. But you, now you'll know that I'm the one doing it through you. All right, so what I want to do is look at one of, I want to look at what, the, what we believe as the old theologians, the preeminent apostle of the New Testament, who was not one of the 12, and that's Paul. And we know he's an apostle. A third of the time the word apostle is used in the, in the New Testament, it's referring to Paul. There's no doubt he was an apostle. Just one verse, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. I'm going to show you when he was called and when he was sent. Um, in Acts 9 is when he got saved, that's when he was called. And this is what God told Ananias, who laid hands on him and prayed for him to receive his sight. This is what God told him to to say. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. There's the what and the where and the when. I mean, and the, and the whom he was going to do it. This is, this is what I've called him to do, where I've called him to do it, and to whom he's going to do it. But the when wasn't yet. All right. So, there are three things, y'all, y'all knew I'd have three. There are three things that you need to develop in your life to be able to fulfill the call that's on your life. In other words, to get to where the Holy Spirit can send you, all right? Here's number one, relationship. Relationship. Acts 9, and we're looking at the life of Paul. Acts 9, right after Paul gets saved, verse 26. And he was called Saul until he was called Paul. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the sent ones or to the people who equip others to be sent, to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he'd spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. How long was he with them coming in and going out? How long did he, was he building relationship? Well, um, let me say another way. How long did it take the preeminent apostle of the New Testament (laughs) to go from his calling to his sending. He was called in 34 AD, one year after Christ was crucified. Some say four years that he was crucified in 29 AD, which I actually believe that. And because he was born in four BC. Uh, And we've talked about that. But the point is a few years after Christ resurrected, he was called in 34 AD. He was sent in 48 AD, 14 years. It took the preeminent apostle 14 years. 
Hey, it took Jesus 30 years. It's, this is going to be, this is a process God's saying through. That doesn't mean you don't minister to people during the process because you're saints and we all minister to people and we're all with us. And Paul even did some preaching during this time. But in Acts 9, he's called. In Acts 13, he's sent. And there's 14 years between. Now, relationship is so important to your calling and to you being able to fulfill your call. It's very important. Um, let me just show you something. This is the way sometimes we have to hire people. In our company, uh, your business, your organization, sometimes in the church, we have to look outside instead of raising up from within. Sometimes that it just has to be done. But this is what happens, uh, and I want to show you this process, all right? The first thing we give this person when we hire this person is a position and with that position comes authority. That's the first thing we give them. Okay, you're hired to be this manager, and you have this amount of authority. Now, with that position authority comes responsibility. We hope he or she can fulfill that responsibility. And the next thing, we hope we can trust them. We hope we can trust them. And we hope that we'll have time to develop a relationship with them, but we probably won't because we'll both probably be too busy. This is the way most people are hired, are given authority in companies, churches, businesses, all over, even volunteers. We give them a position where it has authority with it. They have responsibility. We hope we can trust them, and we hope that we can uh, build a relationship with them. Now, by the way, I got this from Pastor Olin years and years ago at Shady Grove Church. When he put it on the board, it was so eye-opening for me. But the Bible actually turns this process around. The Bible says the first thing I want you to do is develop a relationship with them. As you develop a relationship with them, you learn to trust them or not to trust them. Everyone understand that? <laughs> Some of them you learn not to promote, not to trust. But if you learn to trust them, then you give them some responsibility. And if they fulfill that responsibility, then you give them a position. And with that position, God gives them authority because authority comes from God. Are, are, you, are you all with me? This is the way. Relationship is so important. I was thinking about uh, Pastor Thomas has been here 21 years. We started 22 years ago. Pastor Todd, 20 years. Uh, Pastor Tom Lane, Kevin Grove, I've known for 30 years. Pastor Steve Doolin for 30, over 30 years. Uh, but Pastor Olin, 40 years. Pastor James Robinson, who's one of our apostolic elders. Pastor Olin's one of our apostolic elders, 40 years. Th these are people I've known. I've built relationship with them. They know me. They can speak into my life. I speak into their life. Listen to this scripture. I love this scripture. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. In other words, of someone he's in relationship with. Now, this word countenance does mean face, but it goes deeper than that. It means, um, what well, it means your personhood or your character, your personality. It means what's going on inside of you that causes your face to look like it looks. <laughs> your countenance. In other words, if your personhood, your soul is sad, your face is sad. If you're excited, your face is excited. And your personhood are, are made, your personhood is made up of the experiences that you have had in life so far. So let me say another way. Uh, if you were bullied as a child and you haven't been healed of that yet, and Jesus is the only one that can heal you, but if you haven't been healed of that yet, and he uses the word and he uses counselors, there are people who have the gift, a gift to help you get through these things. But if you haven't been healed of it, when you're given authority, you'll be a bully. But the people who can help you with it are people you're in 
relationship with. And as iron sharpens iron, you know, I've seen about the, over 30 years how Steve Doolin and I have spoken in each other's lives. And he's helped me and I've helped him. But it's because we have a relationship. So you will never fulfill the call of God on your life and be sent, be a sent one until you first develop a relationship with some people that can help you. Here's the second one thing you need to develop, stewardship. Now, I'm not talking about money, okay? But I, we will talk about money in a little bit because that's part of it. But I'm going to talk about other areas of stewardship. Acts 11, verse 27, and in these days, prophets came. Now, remember, Paul got saved in Acts 9. This is Acts 11. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, that's the way we give, by the way, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Now, I just need to say something I didn't say earlier. We're obviously already helping refugees from Ukraine, obviously. We, we have in place church partners that do this. If you want to know how you can be involved, you can go to our website, all right? But we're already doing that. When a crisis happens in the world, by the time you see it on whichever news channel you watch, uh, Gateway Church is already on the way. Just, just That's just normal for us, okay? So we're, we're already there. So, so, and if you want to, if you ever want to give to it, great. That's fine. If you, that, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want any begrudging givers, but if you want to give, then you can, but each according to his ability. That's the way we give. Okay. Verse 30 says, this they also did and sent it, same verb in the Greek for it to be an apostle to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, here's what I want you to notice. This was their first task given to them by the elders of the church or the leadership of the church. But it wasn't to go preach a citywide crusade. It was to carry a bank bag from one city to another city. See, if you can't be faithful in little things, you can't be faithful in much. And Barnabas and Saul were considered teachers at the time, not apostles yet, teachers. And they also said, and stay and teach the people something. And they stayed for a year. So this is part of it. So um, it has to do with more than money, but it has to do with money. You know, when Elaine started dating uh, Ethan, um, you know, some of them were standing around joking about it and at the, the young adults after service, and they got to joking about what's it like to date the pastor's daughter. And one of them said, you know, your dad is so serious about tithing. They said this to Elaine. I'll bet he even checks the tithing records of the guys that want to date you. And my daughter said, he does. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Why would I give my daughter to a man, to steward, who can't even steward money. I mean, that's the easiest thing to steward. I mean, that's, that, that, it's dollars and cents. They add up. Two plus two always equals four. If you make four, you can't spend five. That, it's the, it, please tell our government that, somebody, please. <laughs> so it's, it's, that's the, that is the easiest thing to steward is money. And because you can, it's math. It's just that easy. And you say, I'm not good at math. Well, a lot of us are. We can help you, okay? <laughs> we can tell you if you make 4,000 a month, you can't spend five. You know, that's just simple math. All right. So that's easy. But I want to get, I want to tell you three things about to, the assets that God gives us all to steward money, time, and energy. And I just want to give you a little wisdom about them. All right. So first of all is money. He gives us all money to steward, all right? As you get older, you get more money, I hope. In other words, hopefully, you're making more in your 50s than you were in your 20s, hopefully. If you're not, contact us, we'll help you, okay? But hopefully you are. So God gives us, so you're, you're to steward money and 
you got to get really good at it because you're going to have more one day, all right? The second thing we're to steward, the second asset is time. What you need to know about time is it's the same for everyone. You never get more time. Now, as you make more money, it seems like you have less time, actually. People say, I want to make more money so I have more time with my family, and it works the opposite because you also have more responsibility. So you actually have to steward your time better the more you make. Y'all, y'all are getting real quiet. <laughs> Some of you don't believe me. Just let it happen to you. Because the more you make, the more you work many times. And you think the less I'll have to work, but it's not right. It's the more responsibility you have, unless you steward your time well. So I just want you to understand that time, every one of you, I don't care how rich or how poor you are, you only have 24 hours a day. Nobody has more time or less time. Everybody has the same. The third thing is energy. It's the third asset God gives you to steward. You have to steward your energy. Now, I hate to tell you this, but as you get older, you will have less. Less. So you won't be able to do as much in your 60s that you did in your 30s or 40s. You won't have the, you won't have as much energy as you did. So you have to adjust this. I've been, uh, pretty good most of my life stewarding money, resources. Um, I've had, I've made a lot of mistakes in stewarding time and energy because I, I didn't realize that the, the, as my responsibilities got bigger, that my time seemed to get less. It didn't get less. It was the same but I didn't realize my responsibilities got more, which meant I had to. And I didn't realize as I've gotten older that my energy got less. So that's just a little about stewardship. But is there any area of your life that you're not stewarding well? Because if there is, it can affect your calling and your sending. Um, One thing I've been very honest with you guys about is another thing I've not stewarded well is eating and exercising. Um, when it comes to eating, I love Bluebell. I have a relationship with it, a long-term relationship. You know, when I got out of the hospital a few years ago, uh, I think it was the CEO or the president or one of the high executives sent me 52 coupons for a half gallon each of Bluebell. So I could have a half gallon a week to recover. <laughs> so, so, and I, I, by the first time I could speak at staff chapel, I thought, I don't, I don't need 52 and plus I can afford my own bluebell, but this could be a blessing to our staff. We have 600 paid staff, a uh, full time, 700 part time. So 1300 of them. So I took the 52 coupons and I put them down here on the stage. Everybody's sitting out there. And I said, you can have one per person, one per family in essence. So not five, if you have a family of five. One per family, and I said, I'm just going to step over the side, and the first 52, it was like hogs at the trough. <laughs> and there were a few fights, just to be honest with you. Just, just okay, I'm just joking with you. All right. <clears throat> but you got to learn to steward. Debbie and I now have, um, we used to ride bikes, because I like to do things in the outdoors. I've never been good at in, indoor exercise. That's, I just don't care for it. I don't care to watch the news while I'm doing, you know, I watch sermons if I have to do something indoors. But we used to have these bikes, and now we don't. But we went a few months ago and bought electric bikes. Have you heard of these? They're the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> but you have to pedal, so you do get some exercise. But there's four speeds, so you can keep it on a lower speed, so you have to work harder. But if there's a hill, you can put it on turbo. <laughs> it's great going up a hill and riding past those arrogant bike riders with the yellow shirts, you know. Just... So I like turbo. So uh, we did go riding a while back, and uh, I, I got down to one bar, 
and the batteries has done so well. They said, try to get it down as low as you can before you charge the battery. We were about two miles from home and the battery ran out. And so um, that will never happen again. Um, but okay, so here's the third area you need to steward, all right? Leadership. Leadership. Look at Acts 13, verse 2. Acts 13. This is when Paul's finally sent. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the whole, now that's the leadership of the church. The Holy Spirit said, now. Remember the call, the sin is the, the win. Now, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. He called Saul 13 years, uh, 14 years before. And then verse 3, then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them, apostelos, apostello, pardon me, away, the verb. So being sent by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. I want you to notice something. The leadership sent them, laid hands and sent them. And the Bible says, so being sent by the Holy Spirit. Now, please hear me. This really follows up on Josh's, Pastor Josh's message last week. And um, we, we didn't talk about what we were going to preach, you know. But apparently, we're talking to the same person. So you need to know from the Holy Spirit, he's saying something about being committed to your church. He's saying something. The, the preeminent apostle of the New Testament was committed to the local church. And he was committed to leadership, servant leadership. And because he was sent by the leadership of the church, the Bible tells us he was sent by the Holy Spirit. Is that incredible? Because he was sent by the leadership, he was sent by the Holy Spirit. So God wants to send you. And listen to this. God wants to send you somewhere he wants you to go to do something he wants you to do to minister to someone he wants you to help. He wants to send you to somewhere he wants you to go and something he wants you to do, and there's someone he wants you to help. But will you develop some character qualities in your life so that when you step into the call of God, you have the character to support the sending or the anointing of God? Um, years ago, uh, there's a guy that I'm not going to tell you his name because you would know the name of the company. But there's a guy that owns a, a national and international company. Uh, it's a hunting company. So if you're not involved, involved in hunting or sports, you might not know it. But if you were involved in sporting, you would know this, this company. It's the leader in uh, this particular area of hunting supplies. And the Lord just spoke to me one day and said, I want you to pray for this man. I want you to pray for this founder and CEO of this company. So I started praying for him. Well, a few years later, Franklin Graham introduced us to each other. And we started texting and calling and sending pictures, you know, between each other and things like that. About a year ago, he texted me, he said, we, my wife and I watched you on television this morning, and um, I just felt like we ought to ask for prayer and help because a month ago, we lost our 35-year-old son to cancer. And, uh, you know, it just breaks your heart when you hear something like that. But immediately I thought about a couple in our church that lost a grown son as well and that ministered to other people now. And so I called him and said, I told him about him, and I said, this is a business guy too, and that he's a, he owns a ranch and he's a hunter as well, and he has some of your products. Um but they lost their son a few years ago. Can I hook you up? 
And you can't imagine how many times he's texted me and said, thank you. They have helped us more than anybody. Here's what I want to tell you. Is you may be even going through some things right now that are really difficult. But God could be using those things so that one day he can send you to help someone. This is why we need apostles, because apostles equip us to be sent with a message. I want you to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. So every weekend we ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? I talked about relationship. You know, are you, are you really developing deep relationships through the church, especially through a small group, uh, strong believers who can help you? Talked about stewardship. And again, that doesn't just involve money, but it does, it includes it. But are you really learning how to steward your time, your energy, your resources? so that you can steward more responsibility when the Lord gives it to you. And we talked about leadership. I hope you haven't been hurt by bad church leadership, but maybe you have. I I, I want you, I want to see you healed so that you can trust and really belong to a church And trust the leadership, even though they're humans, but trust that the Holy Spirit's going to lead that church to help you and to minister to you and to equip you to be sent. So let the Holy Spirit speak to you, whatever he wants to speak to you through this message. Lord, I want to tell you, thank you for the gifts of Jesus. I tell you, thank you that you gave us these five gifts. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at these five gifts over the next few weeks, that you will show us how you are trying to equip us so that we can minister to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone, I'm Pastor Robert, and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Be sure to share what God is teaching you in the comments below so that it might encourage others. And click the subscribe button and then tap the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget, you can watch full episodes anytime right here on my YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching.